She's a Dubliner who has lived in Paris, London, the Middle East, and various places in the U.S. Please welcome Emer Martin. Thank you. Actually, I first met Michelle when we were both doing a reading with Irvin Welsh in like 99 or something. That's how old I am. But uh, <laughs> we, uh, uh, we arrived, it was at the Edinburgh Castle in San Francisco. And it was Michelle T, myself, and Irvin Welsh. And there was a big line right around the corner. And I was arriving with a friend, and I said, oh, th that's for me. They're all waiting for me. But they weren't, but they were waiting for Michelle, right? <laughs> um, so thank you for having me along here. And uh, I'm, going to read, I'm going to read two short pieces. And this one is from my third novel, or as they say in Ireland, my third novel. But <laughs> I have no joke about my fourth novel, so I just keep using that joke. <laughs> Uh, Baby Zero. Baby Zero is a novel, I suppose, it's, uh, it's about an Eastern family, Middle Eastern family who go through a revolution and through the refugee camps and arrive in Los Angeles. And uh, in a way, my in-laws are Iranian, and I used, as I was writing it, I used to think of it as my divorce novel, but then we stayed together, and so, but I still published it. He hasn't read it. <laughs> <laughs> and this part is where Zolo and Leila, they've left the refugee camp and they've been entrusted, their parents are still there and they've been entrusted into their care of their uncle Mo, who is setting up a plastic uh, uh, surgery practice in Los Angeles and he's their legal guardian and he's, uh, he's a bachelor and he has absolutely... Uh, no idea how to deal with the kids. So this is them arriving after the revolution in California. The two children sat in the sky, immaculate, blameless, not in control. When they touched down, winter just fell away. They were stunned, as if the world had started turning backwards. Los Angeles sunshine, pure, golden, banging off the wall, sending the sky up even higher. Zolo and Leila saw their Uncle Mo at the airport. They ran to him and he threw his arms about them. He took their one suitcase and led them to the car. I'm setting up a clinic here, so I'm very busy. You two are old enough to entertain yourselves. Get yourselves organized. What age are you now, Zolo? 17? When I was 17, I was already putting myself through college. My parents gave me nothing. They were still beating me with a stick. And my grandmother was beating them with the same implement. They say you were as gifted, Zolo. You'll do medicine, no doubt. Follow me into my clinic. Cosmetic surgery is the way to go here. These Americans are so stupid. And the Arapians who made it over here, they're even dumber, richer, and uglier than the Americans. There's going to be so much work. <laughs> Layla was trailing behind, blinking in the sunshine, very hot in all her layer of clothes. Zolo stopped in irritation to wait for her. Mo walked on ahead at a brisk pace. Come on, Zolo. He threw the suitcase into the trunk of his Lincoln. You'll go to USC, University of Spoiled Children. You'll fit right in. You must get the forms and all that. I don't have the time. Remember your father used to bring you into the surgery and stand you on a crate to watch our operations? Layla was removing her coat and her sweaters. Mo appraised her for the first time. She's pretty, your sister. We'll find her a good husband. We'll find her a doctor, but she's a bit flat-chested, and they don't like that over here. We can fix that, Zolo. We can't, we. You and I, Zolo. Zolo frowned. I'm 13, <laughs> Uncle Mo. Layla's 10. Mo is already in the car, searching all his pockets for the key. Layla and Zolo climbed in. Zolo was in the front seat. Mo was lost in thought. Then he said to himself, 10. Well, my mother was married at 10. She was a mother at 13. Layla was looking down at her chest, and Zolo shrugged. Layla bit her lip and touched her finger to its soft, moist swell. The city outside was full of blank spaces and one-story buildings. National Geographic had somehow given her the impression that the whole foreign world outside would be underwater. She felt oddly betrayed to be driving and not looking at strange fish and coral. If your father had listened to me, he wouldn't be in the mess he was in now. He's ruined you all, running around after queens and princes. They weren't a royal family. They were just a jumped-up military family with no royal blood. Idiots, thugs, all of them, American and British puppets. And this new bunch, 
They'll be worse, no doubt. Arapas always had governments that went out of their way to kill their own people. Uncle Mo, Leila leaned in between the seats nervously. When will you get Mama and Baba over? She knew he heard of her because he flexed his hands on the wheel in irritation. Mo grabbed Zolo's nose suddenly and pulled it hard. Zolo flew forward, his arms flapping and his hands trying to peel his uncle's hairy fingers away. This is becoming quite a conch, Zolo. I'll take the end off it next week if I've time. Then he glanced at Layla. God knows what will appear on her face in a few years. Mo left them off at his beachfront house in Malibu. To Layla and Zolo, it looked like a blue wooden shack. They walked inside in a disappointed daze. He had owned a mansion back home. There was only one bedroom here and a living room with a kitchen counter in the middle. Zola went on to the deck and Mo, with Mo to look at the Pacific Ocean. The deck was bigger than the house. Unlike all the neighboring decks, it had no tables, no chairs, no plants. I'm tired, Layla complained, lingering at the French doors, cupping her hands over her eyes to see two floating human shapes in the intense sunlight. You've jet lag. Zolo was delighted to inform her. Will I get better? No, it's fatal. <laughs> Uncle, Layla said, why is your house so small? Mo twisted around a raid. Small? This is fucking Malibu. Do you know how much this costs? Do you have any idea where you are? No, she doesn't, Zolo laughed. She's just a little frog. Layla slunk away from the doors and sat on the big black leather L-shaped couch. Mo drew his nephew into an embrace. Zolo, you've great things ahead of you. There are opportunities here that you never dreamed of. This lousy revolution was the best thing that could happen to you. Mark my words. The doorbell rang. Mo swept into the front room, opened the door. Suddenly a woman with blonde hair and a red leather jacket stood framed in the light. The woman smiled nervously at the children. Mo was opening drawers in the kitchen part of the room. In a frenzy, he was throwing boxes on the counter and putting on white gloves. Zolo, come and observe. You'll learn a thing or two. He beamed at the woman. Rita, this is my young apprentice. When I have my surgery up and running, he'll be the heir to it all. We'll work side by side as I did with his father. Rita took off her jacket. She was tanned and wore a tank top. She knew where to sit and what to do. Obviously, she had done it many times before. When she was sitting firmly on a stool by the counter, Mo came with a needle and injected it straight into her forehead. What is it? Zola was standing by his uncle. Botox. It's a form of toxin that causes botulism. Technically, it's a poison. Layla looked up. When she realized this woman was being killed, a frost formed beneath her skin. It paralyzes the facial muscles. You don't use your face. As a result, you don't get wrinkles. You don't get old, Rita managed to say. Oh, you get old, all right, Rita, Mo winked, but your forehead will stay young. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about Aladerm, Mo. Mo, Mo, we're not past the stage of formalities, are we not? Call me doctor. Well, Dr. Fatigaga, uh, Aladerm, tell me about it. I can do that too, but that's permanent. Look, Rita, I'll have the surgery up and running soon. These injectables are not the answer. You can't beat a good facelift. Aladerm is taken from corpses. I can fold it, roll it, stack it. It'll fit into your face. It'll become you, become your own tissue. Five years from now, when your jaw drops, he patted her jaw and slid his finger down her neck, and your neck becomes a real turkey gobbler. Then, when I'm pulling your skin during the operation, the filler will still be in, and it won't move anywhere. You'll be left with a big lump. Other doctors will do it, but I have scruples, Rita. Just keep getting the Botox every two months, and even after the surgery, we'll use it to fill out lines. Then he kissed her, and she smiled at him, and then he touched her lips. I need some more bovine collagen, don't I? Rita said eagerly. Rita wrote a check, and Mo saw her to the car. She had a red Corvette that matched her jacket. Zolo whispered to Layla, he doesn't even have a clinic. Mo showed Zolo how to clear the counter. Rita is addicted to this stuff. I charge only $300. Till I get my surgery, word of mouth, I do it here. Easy money, Zolo. In fact, I might marry Rita. I need an American passport. You should marry someone, too. You have to find a born-again Christian. That's what she is. They're the most stupid people in America. <laughs> L.A., this is the good life, Solo. You like it here. Eight years old on bicycles and rollerblades. The Americans don't believe they can die. They don't even think they use the toilet. They call it 
the restroom, the powder room. But it's best to stick to the edges of this country. Deep inside this country is a place called the Midwest. <laughs> and the real piggy Americans live there. They actually have faces like pigs, and their bodies are pink and hairy. Mo went to the bathroom. He stayed there a long time and left the beach house in a cloud of aftershave. I'm going to skip forward just to the bit where they fall asleep, and then Mo is taking them out for something to eat. At daybreak, Mo came tearing onto the deck. He stopped short on discovering the two children sleeping on his property. Get up, get up, you can't lie there like peasants, like refugees. I, I have a ref reputation in this neighborhood. This is fucking Malibu. Suddenly he stood still and put his hands up and surrender. Come, come on, come on inside. They stumbled after their uncle as he showed them the couch. Haven't you ever seen a fold-out couch? Good Lord, what am I going to do? This isn't going to work out. Why didn't you use my bed? Zolo said, well, it was a water bed. It was weird. She's hungry. He pointed disdainfully at Layla. OK, Molo, Mo, Zolo, and Layla sat on a wooden bench in a restaurant by the sea. The waitress came with a tray of oysters. Layla wouldn't eat them. They looked like melted eyeballs. Zolo wasn't too keen either, but his sister's disgust spurred him on. This is grown-up food, she whined. Look at your brother. Mo ruffled the boy's hair. I am 10 years old. Layla pounded her fists on a pile of oysters, sending them flying. Zolo looked at his sister with interest and then at Mo. Mo was lighting a cigarette and sitting back as if scrutinizing the sea. He drummed his fingers lightly off the table. Zolo, you're going to have to teach your sister manners. No man will have such a willful little animal. I don't want a stupid man, Layla wailed. Zolo nodded. Thanks for the oysters, Uncle Mo. They're delicious. I think Layla should go on the next plane back to Ishmael and Farah to the refugee camp. And you? Mo asked Zolo. I might return to Orap. Orap? Well, this is the greatest moment in history, and I should be there. You want to go back and fight the revolutionaries? No, Uncle, I want to join them. Then Zolo took out from his pocket a picture of the revolutionary leader and unfolded it. Leila came back to the table. The leader was an old man with black eyebrows and a long gray beard. He had a red turban and a red and white robe. His face was gaunt and his eyes were shadowed. One eye was pure white. The other was swollen in its socket. His face was without wrinkles except for four lines, two down from his mouth and one, two from his nose. Z Leila noted this and pointed to the picture. He needs injections there and there, Uncle Mo. <laughs> and then she made a scissors no motion with her fingers, and the end of his nose needs clipping. Mo roared with laughter. Maybe it's you who'll be my surgeon. Your brother is an idiot. Zolo focused a fanatical glare on Mo as if to reduce the man to ashes. Mo is implacable. Derisively, he wasted, wait, waved his manicured hand at all the other customers, eating seafood, talking on phones, sipping white wine. Take a good look at these people, Zolo, these Californians. Do you think any of them know where your country is? Have they heard of it? A news item before the sports section between Hollywood Minutes? Do you think when they've 200 channels that they even watch the news? When it by chance lights on our poor nation? And if perchance they do deign to alight for a second on us, what do they glimpse? Endless lines of badly dressed, rumpled refugees spilling unwanted over borders because we can't keep our leaders under control. People with nothing left but big plastic bags of clothes and a few momentum mentos. Your beloved leader with his cataract eyes and red hat. What is he? Another Santa Claus of the atomic age? Beliefs. What are beliefs? Can you touch them? Drive them? Live in them? Eat them? These folks, they want to live in huge houses, big enough to be schools or hospitals or hotels back home. They want to lie on beaches that are not filled with landmines. They want to eat fresh food that they don't stand hours and long lines for. And they want to stay young for as long as possible, or at least look young. Are they better than we? Maybe. We do want to look like them, blonde, and we want their noses. Sure, they have their miseries, their cancers, their car crashes, and they all end up rotted in the ground or piles of ash, and their children resent them and blame them for their own petty failures. But this is the fatal difference. They do not get carried away 
by ideas. <laughs> that is the rub. These people are animals, but they know it more than we do. Food, shelter, prestige, sex, like the tribe of apes we are. Leave ideas to the fanatics. Live your life here in California like the animal you are and enjoy it. They left the restaurant and got into his car. Zolo searched through all the music selection and frustration. Beethoven, Beethoven, Beethoven. Mo, all you have is Beethoven. Well, I was told when I came to this country that Beethoven was the best. Why should I listen to anything but the best? Mo rooted around in his pocket and found a card. By the way, I know Arapians don't have middle names, but you need one. Get yourself one that means something. Mo gave Zolo his business card with a flourish. Zolo and Layla read it. Does the mirror make you miserable? Time can and will be reversed. Dr. Muhammad Ludwig van Fatagagas, plastic surgeon. I exist to recapture splendor. Thank you. Holy crap, Emer Martin. That was so good. So, so good.